settings uh, 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 down below in the, the three double points, and you can do uh, uh, activate captions, and you can, in the settings you can choose also Spanish. So that's a little tip. Um, uh, I, I, where do I have a short introduction, Derek, David, about what I'm... I think we'll hand it over to Ignacio first for... Uh, <laughs> The general introductions and then uh, and then go from there. Then I come, I start streaming. All right. There you go. <laughs> and then we there's already a question. <laughs> so Geno Geno is raising his hand very early. Yes. Go ahead, Geno. Uh, no, I just wanted to say that um, that what Tom just said is amazingly uh, useful, especially for those that do not have like really good skills of uh, you know English communication. So maybe before actually starting the uh, the, the webinar, maybe we can uh, uh, tell our presenter, uh, sorry, uh, our attendants uh, in Spanish that they can enable the um, the yeah. subtitles. Yeah, good idea. Okay. Uh, eh, bueno, gente, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo están? Mi nombre es Gino, yo soy un participante como todos ustedes. Eh, básicamente, eh, Tom nos acaba de, de dar un muy buen consejo, eh, dado que él no habla español, eh, pero nos indicó que hay una forma de agregar subtítulos a la reunión eh, que se generan automáticamente y se pueden traducir al español. Eh, para hacer esto, en la parte de abajo del Google Meet, eh, a la parte del botón de colgar, hay tres puntitos eh, este botoncito cuando ustedes lo tocan hay una, un botón que dice activar subtítulos y a la hora de tocar ese activar subtítulos eh, ustedes pueden también seleccionar la opción hay como, una, como un engranaje el cual ustedes pueden tocar y eh, traducir al español del inglés and that was it uh, thank you very much Perfect. thank you very much well Welcome everybody. Um, we we sent an invitation um, telling people that the the activity will be held in English, so most of the people will understand. They will only ask our speakers to speak slowly, and um, that that will be that will make it intelligible for everybody. I think. And thank you, Gino, for and Tom for suggesting the captions. Three dots. Tres puntos, ustedes pueden escoger ahí, hacer subtítulos o turn on the captions. Okay? Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Marco, for helping organize this. David Moison for his support. Uh, we have Tom and Sarah already. Uh, I don't know you before, so I would first ask you to introduce yourselves who you are, what do you do? And then in the in the discussion, we will know how do you, did you get into the no code, low code world view and making things happen, which is a, the real meat of this, sorry for vegetarians, of this meeting today. So perhaps Sarah, could you introduce yourself please? Hi, good afternoon everybody. Um, my name's Sarah. I'm the founder and CEO of Mindsful, a mental health platform to assist adults and children on their mental health journey. Um, I also work with NHS England to launch digital solutions across the healthcare network in the UK, the United Kingdom. Um, I came across No Code Low Codes um, when I was uh, speaking with David Moyson. Um, and found out about the, the ease of the, of the platform um, based upon what we were already doing, um, looking at developing our platform. Um, and we, we just fell in love with the ease and um, the lack of complexity that, that was needed to, uh, to, to build our platform um, and how agile it was. So for us working in, in, in the, the healthcare space, it's very, there's a massive need to, 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 to sort of, you know, be able to change things quickly. So that, that's why our, our, our journey started um, with the low code, no code platform. Thank you. So we will know much more about your experiences and your views on this. Yeah, next few minutes. Perhaps Tom can introduce yourself, please. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Tom van der Aaren. I uh, work for Evidencia. I'm a Chief Innovation Officer 
Agnesia is a, a multinational which uh, buys and uh, uh, veterinarian clinics uh, all over the world, and they are not in the, since last year the largest in the world uh, of its kind. Um, um, as I am responsible for uh, the IT development in the Netherlands and also uh, Belgium and uh, Germany, etc. I, when I started uh, at Evidentia in 2019, I, uh, yeah, I encountered a lot of, because it was a kind of startup, a lot of issues, a lot of things I thought, okay, we have to do that uh, differently and also uh, try to find a solution to, to uh, do it swiftly. And that's where the Amena encountered with the low-code, no-code platform with WEM. And we created some amazing things, what I will, uh, of course, tell it some, some time later. So, um, yeah, then I'm, uh, I'm still enjoying it uh, a lot. So we are now a few years uh, on the way, and uh, we make uh, amazing things. So I can tell you later about it. Thank you, Tom. So for those who do not know David Moison already, perhaps you can introduce yourself. Sure, of course, Ignacio. Uh, well, thanks, Ignacio. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is David Moison. I'm sales director for WEM in the region of Latin America, uh, also involved with, uh, with building a team in the UK at the moment. Um, started with uh, WEM No Code almost a year and a half ago, making our first steps into Latin America, building up a rich ecosystem around, uh, uh, around the tool, uh, doing training courses, finding partners, finding clients, uh, everything. In fact, our first few steps were with, um, with universities. You know, we started doing some training courses with, uh, um, with universities in Panama, which is where I'm at the moment. Um, people in the last year of their systems engineering degree, showing them, you know, the options of, of low code, no code. And in fact, we have about half a dozen of them that took these courses uh, over, just over a year ago now working with us. Uh, so, you know, low code, no code is also good for fast job development, not just for rapid application development. Uh, and I see that we have Sean just joined us as well, Ignacio. So I think I can hand it over uh, to you again. And then Sean is probably your turn to introduce yourself. Welcome, Sean Van Fien, I suppose. I don't know how to pronounce your, your language. Welcome. Uh, just in time for, your intro, for yourself introducing to the audience, please who you are, what do you do, and then we will discuss your experiences and, and views about low-code and no-code. We don't... cannot hear you. We cannot hear you, Sean. Okay, one minute. Okay. Still mute. If we want, maybe Marco, as yeah. our representative, you can have a, a quick intro. Yes, while introduce we... yourself, please, uh, Marco. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Marco Carvajal. I'm a uh, computer engineer. And I've been working in this uh, arena uh, almost uh, 30 uh, plus years. And um, I started a company last year that is called Sandor, uh, uh, focused in low code, no code platforms. Why is that? Um, uh, because uh, the trends in, in software development and the need of uh, this kind of emerging technologies that uh, right now are changing the landscape of software development as a new uh, alternative for developing uh, very quick
quick, uh, in a very quick way, uh, uh, applications, mission critical applications with um, uh, an easy, uh, with easy platforms, with easy frameworks. And I don't want, in my case, to call these uh, as tools. I, I call them platforms and uh, because I, I, I see um, that is uh, this kind of platforms are very robust and 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 I will address that if uh, Ignacio allowed me that uh, later. And uh, I joined as a partner uh, with WEM uh, last year, and uh, from this year we started uh, to sell the platform to in the in Costa Rica and the Central American Caribbeans, and. Um, we are trying to position uh, the use low code, no code platform. Um, uh, this is not for selling to <laughs> at all a, a, a whim, but uh, we decided to use uh, to share these three seminars, uh, webinars, excuse me, uh, with you to for the people in Costa Rica and all of the people that is uh, watching us and listening to us. Um, to know more about the no code, low code field, almost a little bit known in this in this region. So it's basically the reason why uh, um, uh, we are doing this, and why also Sandor uh, 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 identify an opportunity of positioning. Uh, in, in giving services around no code, low code platforms. Thank you very much, Marco. Sean, are, are you already testing? Testing. testing. Go, go, go. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Sorry, my laptop connects to everything but my laptop. Um, <laughs> buenos dias, todos. Buenos dias. Oh, you speak Spanish. <clears throat> Mi esposa es de México, so that's why I speak a little bit of Spanish as well. Um, but uh, I'm Sean van Veen, um, so we know how to pronounce it now, but we can test it later. Uh, I am working within the Dutch government, and since 2019, I am working with uh, the local platform of WEM. Um, basically, because uh, I was in, in my position in that time as manager operations. I was looking for a more flexible application production system uh, to support all the staffing and get rid of the well-known <coughs> access, Excel and other, um, yeah, not easy to reproduce documents and data. Uh, so we started in that time. And by now we have more or less around 80 applications working within the Dutch government on uh, various uh, positions within the government and departments. So we're doing a lot and I'm here to answer any questions which you have on uh, on how the web platform is produced. I can tell you insight of why we chose for WAM as such. Um, and the basic one for that is that the web platform is easy to use for mid-level staffing uh, because citizen development is a, a very much mature way of creating applications from the business and not from IT. Wonderful. And I'm living in Holland and sometimes I visit Mexico and my friends are living in Costa Rica at this really moment so <laughs> I have connections there. Our, our eldest daughter lives in Amersfoort. Yeah. In the Amersfoort, Netherlands. ah yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for introducing yourselves. Uh, Alvaro Cordero is with us. He's the head of the School of Software Engineering. And um, they are the sponsors of this series of webinars. And um, we've, we've been contributing with um, collaborating with Marco for, for many years, myself, and uh, we do hope that he will be joining the faculty uh, soon <laughs> as an adjunct faculty professional. So I'm 
I would like to, to get to know that you, we have three different perspectives today with us. Tom, who is um, with Evidencia. I don't know how do you pronounce your... Evidencia is uh, correct. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, Sarah, who is in a, in a young company, perhaps something like a startup, uh, doing uh, business in, in mental health and mindful, and Sean, who is in the government enterprise information systems, as I understand. So I think we have, we have a very interesting multi-perspective uh, activity today. But I am a programmer at heart, and I, I started 45 years ago not punching cards, but writing Fortran programs. So how, what, what do you think from each of, of your perspectives is the most valuable uh, thing you get from the low code, no code uh, experience of devising new systems, extending what is already there, integrating with what is already there or with your customers or partners? What, what do you think is the most value you get from this possibility of low code, no code, where most of the applications in this world are created in a code full uh, um, impetus <laughs> for many decades? So what, what what is the, the most value? What do you value the most in, the, in your experiences? And you ask it to the three of us or? To the three of you, yes. Yeah, so right. You have different perspectives and you have different uh, time frames for using uh, the, yeah. the web platform or in other platforms perhaps. And you, you might contrast with your previous experiences and what were the drivers for deciding to go into it and then we'll go into more, more discussions and how do you see it from the project management perspective, software engineering, good practices, what, what's, what's good, what's not, what's new. Yeah, what? well, I can, tell, I, I can call you Ignacio, right? That's, uh, I can call you like that or, yeah? I am not you. Okay, I would, um, let, let me start because I think that well, I started programming in uh, binary codes, in hexadecimal code coding just in that time. Um, and we are still needed. That way of thinking of creating applications is still necessary, but we are getting scarce. So the problem is that we have the capacity of people who really know how to build education and we still need them. And even in the low code, there is someone that's building the low code based on the fact that they know high code. Um, so it's not that we lose them, but what is the main advantage is that you can create applications from operations level. So it's not a translation because in the traditional way, a person will say, okay, I would like to have an application that does this, that, that, and that. And with those five descriptions, you are starting to build an application. And then you come back and then we talk about it. Well, it's not completely what I want. And at the end of the day, after a certain amount of time, you deliver the application and they say, time has a little bit changed. So the application needs to do a bit more like this. So the time framing for local development is way shorter and in collaboration with the business. And that is the, for me, the most valuable asset of making applications with low code. Okay. So the time frame and also the collaboration and mutual understanding on what, what's good for the business or. Yeah. And from project management perspective, right, the, the time frame of delivering is, is, 
it, it could be the same because most of the people don't really um, grasp all the processes that are necessary to create the application. Um, but the acceptance of the application is way bigger because they produce it themselves. So there's not, no discussion afterwards like, ah, nice application, you made it, but yeah, we can't use it because it's not good enough. And uh, now they are proud and saying, I did it. We made our own working application. So I measure my value within the Dutch government by the width of the smile of the people that work in the business. Good. And I can tell you that's a lot. But let me hear the other perspectives. Yes, just one thing is that you're collaborating, so you co-design with the people in the business. Yeah. And they, they gain some sort of ownership of of the system by yeah, they, participating they, and getting their yeah. les mains à la patte, their hands dirty. In the they, have to, they have to get their hands dirty. And my basic strategy is that two days a week, I claim resources from the business that work together with me. So we're sitting in the same room the same day and working to create applications. So there's no escape, like, not like ah, I told you what to do and I see you next week. No, you sit there with me, we create the application. So it's it's theirs. Good. Thank you very much, Sean. Perhaps Sarah can, can tell us her perspective. Yes, of course. Um, I mean, from my point of view, I would second um, the previous comments. Um, the scalability, how quickly things can be adapted to change, um, because we're very much working on a model that can change overnight, depending on the end user's requests and needs. Um, at the moment, we're working in the edu education sector, so we're working with schools. So each customer each end user can be different depending on the, on the individual needs of the child so for us no code low code can be easily adapted and changed within minutes um, depending on you know how complex the request is but it is really an agile project and our partners that we were working with that have actually built the platform for us on no code low code um the, the it was such a short project compared to other quotes that we had using the traditional model it was sort of six weeks rather than six three to six months so it, it's it's quicker for us and the whole thing's just seemed a lot more versatile where we could go out and speak to customers and say you know we can do this for you but we can also make bespoke changes based on your needs and we can give this to you within within weeks rather than this is going to be coming back to you within months. So from for me that that's one of the one of the best things about it. It's it's easily adapted and extremely scalable and we can we can make these changes extremely quick, um, which looks great for, for our end users, which are very demanding. If we're working with either the education, government or the NHS, they expect things to be done. Um, and we can give them better service level agreements, which we call SLAs. We can give them you know, better SLAs to put us above our competition. So it's, yeah, very, very, very good. Very, you know, um, for me personally, you know, um, as a company, I'm, I'm one of the directors. I know my partners feel the same. We've actually found it faultless um, and extremely impressed with, 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 with the whole um, delivery and the whole project management has been seamless. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Just, just a pause. I, I will translate some words from Sarah. But I lived in 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 England in the UK for for four years. Yes. So po, po, poco is... español. Okay. Uh, habla inglés. <laughs> Muy bien. <laughs> Bespoke is hecho a medida, tailor made, and NHS es el servicio de salud. Es como la caja de costarricense de seguro en Costa Rica es. Es la organización de salud más grande del mundo. Es, the NHS is the largest health organization in the world. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. And thank you for, apologies if, if, if there's any, any words. Um, no, no, no. no. I, I, will do, I will do my best to, yeah, to, to, not, to not use um, abbreviations, but um, yes, thank you. That's good. I, I live there, so the, 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 here people speak more American 
North American English rather than British English. Oh, but, so. we, we just speak the Queen's English. So it's, it's the oldest, <laughs> oldest form and we're very proud, especially it's the Jubilee weekend as well. So we are, we are very proud. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. So perhaps Tom. Uh, um, yeah, not to, to repeat uh, the other two, uh, uh, Sean and Sarah, I think uh, my case, uh, I'm not a programmer from heart, but I, I, uh, I think in the uh, processes, auto process automation and in possibilities and interoper interoperability, which means uh, that um, I saw from the start the, 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 the possibilities and, the, and also the, the power which the web platform could bring in our uh, uh, company, in Evidencia, uh, especially uh, also uh, not only by building uh, uh, and creating um, uh, 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 an ecosystem uh, which we can change our business processes and, and translate that to uh, to 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 to, to uh, uh, IT functionality, but what I found very powerful and so uh, created uh, some advanced uh, solutions is the interfacing, which is very very on a very high level within WEM. So I created for uh, with WEM the first um, uh, interface with the Microsoft API, which also brought a lot of um, uh, because we went uh, heavy, we used uh, Microsoft Azure uh, in our case, uh, which we, then we could combine the, the Azure environment with WEM, and this also created a very powerful um, a business uh, a model. And also uh, with our HR system, which is in, it's not, not known in the world, but it's, uh, it's called AFAS, and it has our system also which connected to WEM, and then we connected more applications to WEM so that WEM would become kind of middleware. Uh, and then we, yeah, you could see, uh, we also created a robot platform to, to uh, unlock an, uh, uh, legacy uh, applications. We had the uh, practice management systems in clinics with, with, with a kind of legacy uh, application with not a, a mature uh, API. So, all these kinds of stuff we could build and connect to uh, with WEM, which made major, major uh, uh, advances, especially also with the speed of implementation and the maturity which we could uh, have. We could use functionality within a, a very fast uh, uh, amount of time. So this was for us very helpful. And also uh, what I think is most important is the um, to empower uh, the user, the end user, like Sean was telling, and, and, and I think Sarah also, if you see how happy people are when they see that some uh, system like WEM is really helping them to do their daily jobs and to give them uh, uh, yeah, a, a empowerment, which they didn't have before because they had to use an Excel sheet and, uh, and, and aesthetic uh, data. And now we can use real-time data and, and, and real-time uh, uh, instant uh, um, re reporting. So this is very, very, uh, yeah, very nice. And also the cost, eh, of course, because the cost is also a thing uh, had, uh, because of the, of the return on investment is that much faster than your traditional uh, IT uh, uh, development. Yeah, it's, it's always an, it's almost a no-brainer. So I would all who's in this uh, in this meeting welcome to the yeah the new uh, I think the new future of uh, application uh, uh, use and development. And you are a little bit in the front running of this, like I am also. But you will see this will uh, conquer the world in I think uh, in a very short time. That's my opinion. So. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Yes, there, there is an, in, in Costa Rica, there is um, a higher demand of uh, computing professionals in general and software developers in particular than uh, the supply coming out from universities. So 
um, we, we, we see well, Universidad Zenfotec is a university and it also works into continuing education and uh, transfer programs from people from other walks of life into computing. So um, if people can understand and join, and join and become part of the creators of their own solutions, that's a very uh, high valuable va value proposal, I think. Um, I don't know whether, uh, Alvaro, do you have any questions? I, I have a few. Yes, I just like to, I just like to ask how, how resistant is the developer? Okay, in, uh, especially in groups that are used to do almost all in the area of programming, of computing programming. So there are a lot of, of programmers that are resistant to new technologies and new ways for the um, industry to develop the solutions. So I just want to know how resistant they are and how to overcome that problem if we were able to uh, begin to work in with low code, no code. Well, I can, I can give you an answer from the Dutch government. And um, since I'm already applying like 80 applications, um, the, the problem is not the resistance because the resistance is, is a kind of fear. That's number one. Number two is that the resistance in, is more based on the, the fact that they are not known with this new type of uh, development. Um, so the first thing they say, it's going to be shadow IT, we can't mix, uh, uh, mix it, it's not integrated in the system. Uh, but if you tell them, like, yeah, but basically you're correct, we need to address those uh, ideas. But at this current moment, it's access, Excel, email, phone, handwritten. So all those shadow IT or non-IT is already existing in things that the most architects say, oh, we don't want to look at it. So yes, you need to address it. So it really will be a, a, a huge uh, development if you start to use low code in your organization, because then you create the visibility of all the applications type that you have. And by doing it, not by telling it, that's the second part, by doing it, show them what it is. We can build an application, a basic application on the needs within a night. I always start with four hours. I, tell, I give you four hours for free and I will make your first application. And then we are not talking about when, we are talking about functionalities. So there, I'm not coming in with a presentation from PowerPoint. Is this what we do? No, I make the application. And that is the way to convince them. And still you need to address all standard procedures in your enterprise architecture, uh, safety, uh, structure, microservices, API connection, all those kind of things you still need to do. So involve them and there will be no resistance anymore. That's my perspective, what I see now in the past two years within the Dutch government. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I had a question. You just mentioned architecture. What you, you might, you, are you, the three of you, uh, do you have strategy or architecture in which you uh, turn that architectural vision into those applications that will inhabit the, the application, the architecture, sorry? How do you do, or, or are you discovering if it's uh, as you go? If it's uh, a younger business, how, how how has been your experience in that? Yeah, I don't know if Tom or Sarah wants to answer first, but I can give you an idea of what we did. Sarah? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, I can I can quickly. I mean, for us, it was all discovery. Um, whether we were going to have a native application and or a website. Um, portal 
Um, but to start with in our development, we, we've gone for just pure um, desktop based application. From that, we're then going to sort of build up into sort of a native um, iOS and Android application. Um, but for us, it, it was really about discovery and sort of finding how, how far we needed to go. Because obviously, you know, the more you do, the more costs um, come into play. And being a very um, sort of new business in this sector, we, we wanted to sort of just sort of gently dip our toe without taking too much risk. So I think now that we have um, taken the first step and seen how easy, you know, it, it is, um, I think then we, we will work with our partners and with WEM um, to build a native application as well. Um, and also, you know, we're extremely Im impressed about the reporting tools that, you know, the, the equivalent to, to Microsoft Power BI, that we can, all the data that we can s extract using all the plugins that can be, you know, used with WEM as well. So that's something that we're learning. And I think, you know, David the other day shared with us all of the different plugins and, and different um, different things that we can do and how much capability there is on the basic platform. Um, and it's, you know, extremely impressive. Wonderful. And perhaps Tom? Uh, yes. Um, I think I would like to turn it around. Um, normally, especially in enterprise environments, uh, they are looking for standardized solutions uh, because they won't, don't want to take any risk. And my first thing was to convince them WEM is a standardized solution, which is totally customizable because normally yeah, they they, have, they, they think, okay, we would like to have something, but it's always a little bit of water at, in the wine because you cannot have the total functionality you would like to because it's the, the, the standard application won't allow that. So in this, in this, uh, I think in this new way of thinking with WEM, there has to be a, 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 also a change shift in the perspective of the people who are um, making these decisions. And especially, normally, it's in the, in the higher, of course, the higher uh, echelons. And that's, I think that also still has to be some work being done. But it's long, it's, it's, it's now uh, dripping in that this will be a new way. And it's also changing the way how we think about architecture. Because then we can totally uh, uh, focus on, okay, what would we like to achieve business-wise? Uh, not what we are doing now, but what we want to go uh, after now. And that, if we can uh, and, uh, and capture that in our uh, IT environment, we can uh, push uh, much further to the future, which wouldn't be possible with the standardized applications we had in the past. So that's a little bit my uh, vision on it. Is, is it the experience? Thank you, Tom. Uh, the experience of any of you, uh, including David and Marco, that once people uh, in the business or your customers or clients or partners get into this faster results driven uh, uh, systems uh, building production, that they are, they become more inventive about new things to do in the business like uh, i think modifying processes creating new services uh, shortening the supply chains distribution chains uh, and things like that integrating more uh, areas which were separate within the, the 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 business or geographically distributed businesses is is that something that it's already happening in your experiences i think i'll i'll give a quick quick answer to this and i i see john sean nodding very much because i know he has a massive experience with that uh how, how things have you know really blown up within the dutch government from starting with some very specific projects to let's 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 do everything uh this way now it's something that look i come much more from a commercial side right so i am talking to a lot of different uh companies uh some of them that are very open and some of them are very closed and this has to do with 
what you mentioned earlier as well, Ignacio, like the pushback from, from traditional IT against the new way and they don't need us anymore, they're gonna replace us and so on and so forth. Then if you talk to the business, like Sean said, there's all of a sudden this, this, um, this idea that um, we can do a lot more, but even there you have this resistance and, and, and it goes with, with what you're asking for is that people don't think that their problems have necessarily got an IT solution or if there is an IT solution for them, it is going to take way too much time, way too much money and way too much effort and pain to do this. And we see this even in the short space of our demo sessions with our clients, who I've had many of uh, with Marco. Uh, you know, we, we start talking to somebody, a big company. Uh, there are people from the business, from the IT department. Everybody's present. Uh, everyone has their reasons, as always in sales, not to believe a word that you're saying. Um, but then also, like Sean mentioned, we start showing them. And so initially, they think we don't have any issues. You know, we don't have any problems or I don't have any problems that you can solve. That's usually the attitude. And I think that's very much what you see internally within a company when something like a no-code tool gets introduced, usually, you know, in one part of the business before it starts permeating everything else. And we see that even in, a, in the space of, of, of like an hour or two hours of demo where we say, all right, give me a challenge, you know, set me a challenge. Uh, let me build something for you. Uh, Anything, you just throw me an idea. You want a CRM, you want an ERP, you want a system that you know does ticketing for the most bizarre thing that you've never heard of. Um, and we start building. And all of a sudden, within the space of even like an hour or two, you see ha that happening, what you just mentioned, is that people start seeing, actually, I do have a lot more problems than I was willing to admit at the beginning. I think I have more things that can be solved with this and all these things that I thought would not be possible because of the usual constraints, time, uh, short, long lines of, of communication with IT, uh, difficulty of translating your situation in real life to something that is understandable from, from the IT perspective of, you know, what a solution could be, the architecture, the the features, the, the the connections, the integrations, and so on and so forth, it becomes much more tangible. It's much easier to understand. And you see that, and, and I will hand it over over there uh, to Sean, you see that people start seeing all kinds of issues of where they can improve, where they can automate, where they can create completely new things uh, using no code because the threshold is so much lower and it is so much more accessible for non-IT profiles. And we see, just as a last point, we see that there are clients of ours that initially they want to build something for themselves. So they're traditional IT companies, uh, or sorry, traditional non-IT companies. They build something that they know is a big issue and eventually they say, hey, we can sell this, you know, we can sell this in a SaaS solution, make it available to, uh, to a lot more people who have the same issues, which we see in, in, in the education sector as well for research that you have to do. There are standard programs and your SPSSs and all this sort of stuff, but every research is very specific. You know, we have people in the jungle here in Panama doing things that obviously they're not doing in the desert in, you know, the US. Uh, but if you have a tool that is very quick to adapt, then all of a sudden, you know, the creativity gets, uh, gets stimulated. So I don't know if, if Sean yeah. or I see Marco yeah, I mean, really can as well. Marco has a question, yeah. so. <clears throat> no, uh, I, I want to say something about this topic uh, and maybe some others. <clears throat> oh. But what we have seen is that uh, almost uh, in some companies, in, in in some companies, there is a, an issue in adopting these kind of, of, of frameworks uh, because they already have a, a expert uh, software developments, and they say, "No, I'm fine. I, I don't need any more." Uh, 
uh, technologies and or change my the way I work. I um, so so I, I will keep my 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 infrastructure and my resources the same as as usual. Uh, that is one thing that happens. Also, the, when we approach some customers, they uh, are uh, kind of um, um, skeptic, and they decide to, for example, uh, uh, want us to give the information about the competitors and to evaluate some other platforms. That is okay because if you are searching or and selecting and evaluating a product uh, platform, it's okay for you to uh, develop, uh, uh, to engage or to undertake a, uh, an evaluation process. But uh, sometimes it's not for, for really taking, undertake the process, but it's for letting not letting you uh, telling you directly i'm not interested <laughs> and uh, some other in some other cases uh there is uh, uh in the big ones especially in the big ones and uh, and uh, uh solutions architect or uh, an ar architecture it architecture department uh in which they evaluate the, all the technologies uh that could be used in the companies and the business and the even the IT, um, the software development area and the, and the like, they cannot even uh, decide for the technologies. They can be involved by, by um, as part of the process that is driven by the you know, solutions, arch solution architects. Uh, that is something that also has happened to us. Um, uh, um, also, uh, we've seen that, for example, uh, well, in Costa Rica, there is a, a, a lack of interest in, in allowing people, with the exception of one company that we have visited, we have talked to, um, uh, uh, most of the of the companies want these platforms for giving them to the expert IT developers, not for the citizen developers. Uh, I guess that is part of the resistance that Alvaro uh, 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 addressed before, and um, in that sense, uh, it, there is a, a, a need of. <clears throat> Uh, evangelize uh, companies, evangelize companies, and tell them that it's not a, a competition between the citizen developers and the IT experts. The projects must be undertaken by both the citizen developers and the IT experts. Some of them must be uh, developed uh, almost completely with the IT developers that are experts, and some of them will be highly developed by the business with some kind of help from the IT uh, ex experts and uh, with uh, the uh, um, um, and in order to avoid the uh, shadow OD, the government, the governance of the IT have to, to change uh, in order to let the users develop some applications by their own um, and for uh, the fact that they, they cannot uh, be um, uh, out of the radar I, I, if, if, uh, if, if it is okay the word of the IT all the applications either done by the IT or by the user must be in the catalog of IT uh, systems that are part of the of the of the company <clears throat> and i want to also well if you uh, ignacio let me uh, say something about the first questions that you mostly uh, 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 um, 
addressed about the, the issue, the things or the... Go ahead. that are good in this kind of platforms i see are not for developing platforms and if you for example look for um, uh, a platform like like when when is a well thought platform and is well uh, strictly uh, something that is excellent and some others too and if uh, you will use a platform like this, uh, you will uh, constantly having updates. And in that sense, you will not be obsolete very quickly. And if you, for example, are in the business, in whatever business, and you develop your, your framework, that, that is not all, all, always the case. You start programming as you can, as you can. But if, if, let's say that you develop a framework you don't even have time in the future for enhancing the product because the company will ask you for developing systems quickly quickly so they will start using or continue using what they had already and develop and deploy all the applications with an uh, let's say an uh, uh, framework that is not currently up to date in features or in technologies or and very fast you um all of a sudden all of a sudden you have a, a, a framework that is has been used in more than 80 applications 100 applications and then you have a, a, an obsolete platform in everything but with WEM or whatever other product uh, you will have a constant um, upgrades, constant enhancements, and that will force you to uh, keep up to date with all those uh, enhancements and will allow you to stay always in business, avoiding obsolescence. Uh, that is something that I want, wanted to say about uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the things that are important in having a kind of these solutions. I, you mentioned um, some very important things like uh, the possibility of uh, helping build and make uh, the architecture a reality and uh, automation, possibility of bespoke or tailor-made uh, adaptations, integration, middleware, that kind of thing, empowering the user. How, how about analytics? And uh, having having data that can be analyzed, you know, in time frames, classifications, uh, metrics, performance, whatever. How, how do you put that? Do you put that as part of the requirements when you when you develop new applications or you adapt applications? Is the any particular help from the platform in uh, doing that kind of, of work? Not the operational application, but I mean getting that, that kind of data into analysis, get insights, trends. Yes, I, ha I am not the, the one for respond this answer, uh, this question, uh, but, but I think uh, but, uh, the 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 customers that we have addressed yes uh, no, i'm not addressing are, you i'm addressing everybody <laughs> they, they are not uh, wanting us to do to demo that kind of thing uh, allow me Marco, if you yes. will um because uh, i know a little bit about uh, about the cases with uh, well not all of them but i know something about the cases with all three and i think all three of a different ways of uh, answering this question. Uh, I know that there's a lot of data in what, what Sarah is doing with, um, with Mindsful. They do a lot of dashboarding, so I'm sure she can, she can come in from that side. I know Sean as well, they are doing a lot of things with a lot of data, a lot of dashboarding, a lot of, uh, a lot of BI that they're putting on top. They even have their, their own statistics that they have built within a, a module to show 
sort of what they are building and have statistics about what they are doing. Um, and I know that Tom has a, a, a bunch of things on this as well. So uh, who wants to take it first? Any, any volunteers? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I can talk from, from our point of view. Our, our platform comes in sort of two parts. Um, it's the, the end user will log in and, and do what they need to do with regards to their mental health. And on the back end, um, through no code, low code, we've got a portal for the actual education sector or the, the, the health service to log into to see the data based upon what the end users are doing. This is obviously anonymized and falls you know, within the criteria of you know, protecting people. But there are two parts. So for us, I think the most important part of this is actually the data that we extract out of the platform to enable us then to prove that what we're doing is actually worthwhile. So we can see data before they start using the Mindsful platform. And then we can see the data whilst they're using it and after they're using it. And it's, it's really important for us to be able to sit down and show our customers how and how much of a difference that we've made to people's mental health. So having a portal that they can log into and they can see graphs and charts and they can then extract this and put it into their own tools if they wish to as well. Um, by exporting the data that's extremely important um, and it's again it's something that's extremely versatile and, and easy to do on the platform do you perform the, the, the analytics within the platform or do you have to take your data elsewhere um, within thank you maybe tom or sean can add yeah, what, what we do is, is if I understand your question correctly, yes, how you can identify data in, in timelines. Uh, one of the major features in, in the WAM platform is that every data has a timestamp, uh, a timestamp of creation and, and last uh, mutation. It doesn't say what has been done, but that's already there. So while modeling an application, uh, you build in any uh, time setting you want to know. So if you want to have a uh, record in a logbook what it has been changed to a certain amount of data by whom, you can create that by just modeling a very simple routine that every change is being recorded. Uh, secondary is that by using the data, you can choose a date and you can ask the system to show all true elements in that particular date. So you can shift back and forth in time. But the most used is changing the data, who does it in a logbook, uh, and all those kind of things. So basically, that is already in the system, and it helps uh, providing that. So for us, it's clear that the data in itself has enough capabilities to show what is the changes in time. Secondary is that because the system is so flexible, it's very easy to use the system to um, to, to get data in line and to get it really, basically you can do data crunching at a very low level. So you can see the quality of the data very easily and you can show the business what has been done by just preparing some small routines and saying like, okay, if this is the case, what is left over? Uh, for example, in, in my, my last application that I built myself was uh, on a program that called Avestus that we need to um, get rid of in all the buildings in the Dutch government. 34,000 objects are relevant to that scope of that project. Uh, and they need to know which building, when uh, 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 findings has been recorded, when it has been uh, uh, get rid of who has done it, which person. So all the data is now in the system. But we also find some uh, wrong data. They say, yeah, okay, the system says it has asbestos, but we don't have any documentation. So it is in that way you can use the system and you can also use very easily adaptive tools like Power BI to use the data as well. Maybe I can 
a very a little okay. bit about the future of Evidentia in that we are uh, investigating the use of AI, especially uh, for our veterinarians and in our imaging. And we are looking into WebWAM because they have some uh, uh, clients on the platform which, which also built, uh, built it, uh, uh, an image diagnostic system. Uh, and we are looking into uh, using that also in the future for our clinics. And that we can, and RM is that powerful that we could have uh, real time uh, because they have also implemented now already uh, uh, AI uh, nodes within in WEM. So we can use the AI uh, functionality to have real time image recognition of uh, X rays uh, uh, imaging and do kind of pre diagnostic for our veterinarians. So um, that is, would be really, really powerful. And it's, one thing we would try to do uh, for the upcoming year, probably. So it's a little bit uh, future. It's not still. It's not 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 uh, not being developed yet. But it's something we can and we will do in the future. And I think also AI could be a real powerful um, tool. And especially because it's uh, uh, it's it's it's, it's, it's uh, default within WEM to do the data crunching and data mining and. Just the, 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 the analysis which we have now, uh, which have and the trends, etc., and especially um, for a large company as Evidentia, it's, and we have a lot of data uh, which we can then um, make useful, much more useful than we can do it uh, at the moment. So, I think I just want to add uh, a couple of things here, and, and maybe tie in with uh, one of the questions that I saw in the chat is. Um, we have uh, some other clients, uh, company based in Israel, doing a lot of business in the US. They're in medical imaging, uh, and they're already doing some of the stuff that, uh, that Tom is uh, talking about. I think you may have heard of the, of the project uh, from the people at HQ. Um, they are doing uh, image recognition on uh, scans already, like uh, x-rays, uh, brain scans, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you know, looking for tumors and so on and so forth. And while um, different no-code platforms have different accesses or different built-in capabilities of things like AI, uh, of things like, uh, you know, business intelligence and so on added, um, the... And this is where it ties in with the question that I think came from, from Kanisha, you know, is, is low code, no code enough to reach your objective? Um, depends on the case. Uh, depends on the case, depends on what you want to do. Uh, so for example, the stuff that, that Tom is talking about or this other client is doing, the AI part is being done outside of, uh, outside of WEM in this case. So what is happening is that there is integration uh, between a web built application and an external AI service. Now there are plenty of AI platforms. There is even some, some open source. Uh, Microsoft have, I think one called Loeb that you can, you can use fairly cheaply or, or for, for free for a lot of things. Uh, we are working with a company in Colombia and Uruguay who actually have a, a, a no code AI. Um, they put us to the test, like, okay, how quickly can we integrate with you guys? And within sort of uh, half an hour, we had connected to them and we were analyzing brain tumors from an application that didn't exist half an hour before. Uh, so, yeah, that ties in with, with, with what you were asking, Kanisha, is can you build a full application with, with local, no code? Yes, you can. Um, depends what you are building, depends which tool you are building. Some no-code platforms are much more focused on building front ends really quickly and not doing a lot of data number crunching. Uh, some application platforms like WEM are much more focused on um, enterprise grade. You know, we, we like to do heavy lifting with our, with our tools, um, which is some of the use cases that are happening in, in, in the Dutch government are, and I won't mention them, Sean, so I won't steal your thunder. Uh, but some of those cases are, are very heavy lifting. And for example, now recently uh, with Volvo in China, they are building 
um, an application that is collecting and manipulating and spitting out and doing all kinds of things with data that is coming from uh, driverless cars. So millions of data points streaming in, all getting, um, getting absorbed or, or received by an application that is mostly built with web. Not all of it is built with web. I think around 90% it's built by a, by a big uh, global partner of us called DXE Technology. And so that's very complex information that is, that is being received. And of course, they are doing things like uh, BI elements and so on, showing how, you know, in a graphical way, what is happening and so on and so forth. And most of that is done through the standard widgets that we have available in WEM. But a lot of that is done also by custom-made widgets by the partner and by the client because widgets are these little bits and pieces of, of, of functionality that you can drop in anywhere that you want, right? And there is also in, in a lot of no-codes and in WEM as well, there's a, an, an, an editor. And, and I will, of course, say that we do it better than anybody else, but you can forget about that if you don't want to believe me. Um, but you can build your own widgets. You can build your own ways of visualizing. And again, that ties in what we were talking about earlier, resistance from IT, is it fully IT, and so on. There are ways of incorporating and integrating, and that's very important in the cases that you will see um, within Evidentia. I posted the, the, the link to the core first case of WEM, in Evidencia, there's a lot of integrations going on there. So you can have a look at a video and Tom explains it together with one of our partners. I know with Sean that there's a lot of integrating going on as well. So can you do everything with no code? Yes, you can, uh, but it depends on your business case. It depends on your existing architecture. It depends on uh, how quickly it needs to be done, how complicated things are that you're trying to do. Um, and yes, can you integrate lots of BI and so on? You can. And if you want to leave it in Tableau or Power BI or wherever it is that you already know how to do it, then you can use whatever you build in no code uh, as your source of data to, to, to feed your dashboards in a more dynamic way. So there are a million ways of, 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 of solving these issues. Let's put it that way. Just to, to make it uh, a bit energetic, David, I, I would like to contradict you a little bit Go for it. Uh, in this. Um, not that you are not telling the truth, because yes, basically you can do everything. But no one is going to make an accounting system with WAM, because we have SAP, Oracle, or any other uh, financial system. Uh, so you really have to see what do I need, which standard applications are applicable. And I think Tom mentioned it earlier, the, 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 the major feature of these low-code applications is that it becomes a kind of middleware because you can interact it with the standard applications that do accounting very well. Uh, and you can use that information in your WAM application, for example. So. For, for my point of view, I would say you should not try to look for the, uh, uh, the way that you build everything in WAM. True. Create a checklist saying, okay, is there a standard application that does this line of work perfectly? Yes. Okay, then don't build it in WAM. Uh, does it uh, co-align with our enterprise architecture? Uh, if you're working your, your basic structure on Oracle or SAP, stick with that but integrate with the systems. That is the, 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 the way to think on how to use low code in this manner that it really serves your organization. So that's yeah. why I, I, I a little bit want to- no, that's fine. Yeah. I think I, I, will, I will take my, my <laughs> right to response as well. I think, okay, there's a, there's a big difference between can you do everything and should you do everything? And that's very good that you pointed that out, Sean, because, and we don't, suggest that with our clients either, right? Uh, we integrate all the time with other, uh, with other systems because otherwise, if you start reinventing the wheel over and over and over again, then no matter how quick the tool is that you are using to reinvent the wheel, you're still gonna be losing time that is too valuable for your business uh, to be wasting on development. Yeah. What we do see is, uh, and that's very key what, what you mentioned, right? Is there an existing solution that does this perfectly for us? Um, there are a lot of cases where there is an existing tool, 
but you're paying, and this is a lot with, especially with SaaS applications or huge applications, uh, clusters like, like your SAPs and so on, where cost could become a factor, not just functionality, but cost becomes a factor. Will you say, okay, this thing, like Salesforce does anything a CRM could ever want to do, pretty much, you know, including BI on top of what you are doing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm not going to be the one, and I don't think any of our clients or, or anybody here would be there to say, we can do it better than Salesforce. No. Maybe we can do it as good as Salesforce, uh, depending on whoever is building it, but it's not the point. But the point that I'm getting at is that for a lot of companies, um, and this is more sometimes in, in, in more in the sector of, of, of like your startups, smaller companies, et cetera, et cetera, or companies that do very specific things, or companies that integrate with um, platforms that aren't as world renowned, which comes a lot more in, I think that's something we see a lot more here in LATAM, where people don't necessarily need to integrate with what everybody in Europe and the US is integrating with. So you get to a point where you say, all right, there is something that exists. It does everything perfectly, but I'm going to have to pay for 100% of functionality. And all I'm going to be using is about 30% of it. And there you have a, a different kind of use case for, uh, for flexible solutions that you may need rather than, you know, pay 100%, use 30, okay, pay 100% and use 100%. And then it may be interesting that without having to retool or train, I've had plenty, I, like I said, I'm in sales, I've had plenty of training on a million different CRMs. And the more complex the CRM, the more the training is about don't touch this, don't touch that, uh, you know, these are the three buttons out of the 10 that you're allowed to use. And I think we get again closer to the business cases that, that Sean has a lot is that you have the business build exactly what they want and what they need. And you reduce training times, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a, there, there's a trade-off. And, and from a business side, you always have to see what makes sense. And no code is just another tool. Or, or platform that you have available or, or philosophy that you have available to solve your issues. But your issues are always going to be driven by the same things, you know, cost, uh, timing, and how well does this do what it, I need it to do. We have, we have Gina. Thank you very much, David, Sean. We have a lot of so, questions. We have, we have Gino uh, who raised his hand uh, a few minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I just wanted to highlight um, that this is like, if, if you think about it, and let's step back for a minute. If we think of this from a philosophical perspective, we can think these uh, like a, a simplification, right? We are trying to simplify things. And if you think of, of the history and the trend of, of, of programmatics and computer science, what you're doing, it's every time, every iteration, it's trying to simplify itself even more, right? The first time that we saw computers the way uh, analog computers, right? You have like these machines that were doing physical stuff. And then that evolved into ones and zeros. And that evolved then into letters. And then, <clears throat> sorry, and then that evolved into uh, classes and and so on right so it's trying to simplify every every time and um one one thing that it's particularly um resembling to me is that this kind of programming uh, looks a lot like what um another market has been doing for a while which is uh games development right in games development you have like these, uh, they call them uh, blueprints, right? And they connect these blueprints, their logic. It's, it's been um, like developed using these nodes that they connect and they do it visually and they are almost no coding, right? Um, so that's, that's a trend that we see in our, like, in, 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 in our life. We have been seeing it from a lot of perspectives and if we think about it nowadays almost no one has uh, an authentication authorization in, in implementation in their 
code. Uh, most people use Google, Apple uh, identification, Facebook identification, right? So you have, uh, have assigned that responsibility to that authentication company. Now you, you don't integrate that into your application, right? So what I can feel of this, it's, it's something similar, right? You have to identify where this fits the best, right? And as David was mentioning, right, you can build uh, a whole application, a whole environment, right? But there are tools that could do it better, right? I will be, I will be a bit naive if I think I can create a best uh, login uh, system or authentication system than Facebook or Google, right? Uh, but maybe I can leverage that into my application. So um, these no code, low code, it's a way to take advantage of the business logic, right? And create something as fast as possible, but you have to be smart as well. So, and I, as uh, I was saying on the comments, um, just like, <clears throat> sorry, just like uh, these uh, uh, paper that was uh, written, uh, the, um, uh, the no code, uh, sorry, the um, no, uh, silver no silver wallet. Yeah, thank you. There's no single application or no single technology or no single platform that is going to solve every single problem every time, right? So it's just being smart. And uh, this, this actually, no, no code, low code, it's something that uh, it's a tendency. It's where things seem to be going nowadays. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that on top of all this information that you have provided to us. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. <clears throat> so we, we, we've been already an hour, a little bit over an hour. So perhaps we can um, converge into some uh, final remarks on, on each of you. Uh, the very valuable experiences and insights uh, already. And there, there, is a, there is a question here that uh, Federico Humberto Barquero Hidalgo wrote, we will have those in charge of IT expand our knowledge profile to prepare ourselves and have more knowledge of programming than of communications or equipment. What do you recommend for the future IT manager? And uh, Sean has already started to, to answer that. Perhaps some of some other people here are more like software engineers or business analysts or quality assurance or testers, maybe some of your perspectives can, can enrich our own. Go ahead, please. You asked to others now, right? Or? Or Sean or yeah, so, yeah. Sarah. Or other. <laughs> um, there, there are so many people and I thought you said, well, maybe there are others. For me, basically the, the, the IT manager from now really needs to uh, trust the staffing and uh, empowering them with the proper tools, the proper knowledge to create application or to simplify the work. Um, and it's the task of the IT manager to constantly look forward. Most of the people in Holland still look backwards. We work with Oracle, we work with SAP, and that is doing good but we ignore the fact that there is new capabilities. We ignore the fact that there is a lot of shadow IT going on and uh, problems within the uh, working area. So I really think that that needs to change in the IT manager, at least in Holland. I don't know how it is in Costa Rica, uh, but I, th I think that is a change of mind. We need to support the staff in enabling them to work as easy as possible and to make life enjoyable in all perspective and of course for all the other perspectives that you said we need to do the testing yes of course we still need to do tests we still need to uh, create uh, safety measures we need to create privacy in the application so for me that is the standard ruling that we need to do so we don't skip any of the uh, uh, staffing 
that we need in any application building. The only thing is we don't do it in six months time. We do it mostly in six weeks time. So it demands something from us. And for those who want, when we finish off, I have a nice um, graphical view. It's a little bit in Dutch, but I can work you around about uh, creating a Ferrari, which it makes me always talk with the businesses. This is what you need to do in six weeks. So if anyone is uh, um, willing, I am happy to show it at the end of this session. Wonderful, Sean. Thank you very much. So Marco raised his hand. You're on mute. You're on mute. Marco. You're on mute, Marco. Ah, pardon. What I wanted to say is that um, that it is very important for every IT manager and for every IT professional and even for non-IT experts uh, to um, look around and see trends and, and, and that uh, all people uh, become IT vigilant, uh, vigilant uh, uh, that uh, we do not uh, close our eyes and see what is coming and that we are we open to evaluate and to dedicate some time to research about emerging trends that are becoming more mature and that are not threatening but um, uh, kind of uh, uh, ch shaping and, and changing the way things are done in businesses. And uh, that is important because there are um, curves that shown us, uh, sh shown us uh, for example, how different technologies are becoming more mature as the time uh, goes by. And uh, for example, every, I guess, every 10 years at the most, a new or five, 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 10 years, a new technology uh, innovation uh, comes up um, in, in several kind of technologies. And, and we, we need to embrace some of them and, and, and maybe many of them. For example, in the case of low code, um, according to statistics, in the year 2004, 75% of the software that is done uh, by thirds uh, will be done by using low code, no code platforms. And if, uh, for example, uh, for companies, for big companies, uh, two to, three to four, no code, no code platforms are going to be used um, because there are several kinds of no code, no code platforms, IOTs, uh, big for big data, for software development, for um, machine learning, RPA. So um, if you uh, take those into account, you'll see that the business will be better managed by uh, the, a mix of those technologies um, in addition to the traditional way of doing things. Uh, as we said before, uh, this is not for uh, avoiding the other technologies and, and that is better understood because of uh, with this at the um, as, as, as the you know on the base, our basement or foundation of every uh, no code local farm platform there are all the known technologies uh, that are traditional <laughs> technologies the c sharp uh, c++ or whatever the other technologies so there is a mix, mix of technologies that almost will be uh, uh, going and advance simultaneously and will give better, better, and better uh, functionalities to use uh, both and do the best uh, in accordance with uh, which is uh, best to use in, uh, in 
in in a specific solution. That is what uh, I can okay. uh, <coughs> give. I, I feel I would like to to add one more thing that that needs to be addressed. Um, most companies look at their own processes, and what we also what is recommendable for most of the companies is to look outside of their boundaries because every company has its place in the complete chain. And two samples for that in Holland is one, the digital invoicing and the traditional way is you submit the paper invoice, the invoice is being hand manually uh, encrypted into the system, is being checked and uh, evaluated. Normally we will pay the invoices in 60 days uh, so that is our chain. Nowadays, we do that digitally. So we get it digitally. It's being processed directly. It can be paid within five days. So the whole chain of all the businesses need to be addressed. The same occurs with another application that I made with WAM, is that uh, companies can request a subsidy for the Dutch government, and the subsidy needs to be processed. So what we say is, this is the format that you need to submit your request. You need to submit this additional data and it's sent by email or by post. Someone is checking all the data and writing back, sorry, I missed something or it's not correct. And when I show them making that application in literally, I think six hours, I said, okay, the company goes online, fills in the form online, the system checks, do you add a, the relevant documentation? And it comes directly into your system. And the most valuable answer was, if this is possible, why we don't do that for the other 80 subsidies that we have? And so the, the integration goes beyond your own organization. Mm -hmm. Your capacity mm -hmm. building goes beyond your organization. You need to have traineeships you need to have own staffing you need to have external staffing because they bring something new with new technology from other businesses so staffing is not only related to your own company and i think that is, that are two strategies that really can help you in implementing you. wonderful thank you very much Sean. i don't know whether sarah or tom can perhaps contribute to closing no, i think uh sean has uh, said it perfectly so i uh, totally uh, uh agree with him and um uh, and i have to also sign off in a few minutes so because we are a little bit out of time uh, uh -huh. for me so okay thank you so thank you John. But you also are in, uh, uh, implementing this at home because I know that Evidencia gets all the licenses automatically now. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Yeah, so that if there's a new staff member, automatically from all other platforms, there will be licenses requested and uphanded to the staff. So this is a perfect sample of how you create the uh, the thought of implementing with other companies. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's better when I where I started and. And uh, I also would like to incorporate the customer or the end user and, and also the supplier in our um, uh, infrastructure. So that's also what Sean was telling. And it gives much more uh, power, uh, powerful solutions than only to try to solve your own business uh, uh, solution. If you are also looking out of the business, then only in the business. So absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. Sarah? Um, no, I mean, I, I don't have any, anything else to add. I think um, what both the, 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 the chaps have said, I've, 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 I agree with, to be honest with you. Um, and I, I'm the same. I'm, I'm a little bit pressed for time now. Apologies. Um, okay, I have Mark's okay. dispensers knocking at my door very soon, so <laughs> I, I will <laughs> ready for the Jubilee weekend. So I will have to, um, to go shortly. Apologies. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, Tom, Sean, David, eh, Marco, Alvaro, uh, and all the audience for coming today. Uh, 
we will follow up on this. Uh, we'll most probably have some some workshop or uh, you know hands-on uh, thing in the future uh, here by, at Zephotech. Um I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know, Alvaro, would you like to say some words before we part? Yes, first of all, thank you to everyone. And <clears throat> thank you for the experience that you give you gave the students to know about how the things are changing in the industry. I think that's an invaluable experience, especially because a lot of them are just on the verge of getting their degree. So it's important that they know how the industry is going and all the options they have, not only in the traditional programming way, but also in these platforms that are changing the way we interact as developers with uh, the business side of the company. So thank you to Marco, to Tom, to Sean, David, Sarah, and to Ignacio to be the moderator today. And I hope we can do some kind of workshop in the future to show and to let people know about this, this kind of platform. And the, thank you for the opportunity to let uh, the university, Universidad Central Tech, to be uh, a leader in, in trying to let people know about new technologies. David, thank you very much, Alvaro. David. Yes. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, Sean, Sarah, Tom, uh, joining us after working hours from the other side of the Atlantic. I know you guys have uh, families and work on long weekends to get to. So thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to thank the university for, uh, for allowing us to, to be part of this. Uh, I think it was a very interesting discussion. I will add that I am happy to hang around for another 20 minutes because I see more questions popping up, uh, some of them very, let's say, personal about, you know, how can I do this? How can I do that? So I'm very happy to hang around uh, after the, the official session ends uh, to answer a few more questions. I think Sean is also uh, possibly still available a little bit. Um, but thanks very much, Sarah, Tom. I know you guys have to go. Thank you, Marco from Sandor in, in Costa Rica. For, uh, for setting this up as well. And Ignacio for doing an excellent job on, uh, on guiding us through this discussion. So thanks very much to everyone. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thanks guys, have a wonderful we, uh, weekend. <laughs> our, our weekend starts now, we have a four day weekend. So um, <laughs> we are cracking open the gin later. <laughs> bye bye, enjoy your Bye bye, bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye. Ignacio and Alvaro. Uh, go, go ahead. I will turn my mic off. Um, I want to also say thank you to you. Uh, uh, of course, to all the people that uh, that were uh, were uh, customers of, of uh, Gwen and also David. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, especially to you that. Uh, have organized also these uh, webinars and, and all the students that get along with us today. And um, for this opportunity, uh, I think uh, it, it has uh, a great experience uh, with all of the three, three uh, webinars. And, and, and I hope that uh, the people have uh, learned a lot uh, uh, from basics to more advanced elements and have uh, uh, a better idea of what no code low code is thank you Mar thank you marco for for sparking all this it's, uh, it's because of you and uh, we also had uh, mr edwin professor edwin aguilar as part of the public and he he's also been sponsoring this jointly with uh, alvaro who is head of software engineering here Wonderful. Excellent. Este, vi que hay un, unas cuantas preguntas. Bueno, sorry, John. John, ya sé que tú, tú me entiendes, así que... Uh, I, can, I can follow the questions, but, uh, but don't ask me to answer directly. 
No, oh, perfecto. Es que vi que hay unas preguntas que se hicieron en español, quizás hay gente que, que se siente más cómoda. No sé si alguien uh, de aquí tenía otra pregunta que no se contestó o algo que querían preguntar que no se pudo. Como dije, yo puedo quedarme otro 20 minutos uh, por si les interesa. Si no, voy a darle uh, la oportunidad a Sean este, para presentar el slide que mencionó de cómo, cómo hacen sus proyectos. Gracias, Ignacio. ¿Algunas dudas, preguntas? Yo nada más quería una... Mmm. Tenía una duda eh, más que todo con, relacionada con, el, con la parte del de costo para las eh, empresas, especialmente las que están de eh, nivel medio de ingresos hacia abajo, o sea, especialmente las pymes. Digamos, uh -huh. si, hay, si hay algún plan o si más bien el, la plataforma es más para grandes proyectos de estilo ¿Eh? gubernamentales. Sí, este, gracias Álvaro. Tenemos de todo en los clientes. Um, el enfoque principal eh, está en el sector empresarial, o sea, que, digamos, mediano para arriba. Pero igual aquí en Panamá tenemos algunos pyme, pymes y en Holanda también que, que trabajan con web uh, y tenemos planes para, para todo el mundo, digamos. Este... Siempre va a depender de, de tu caso de uso. Uh, WEM, como casi cualquier otra herramienta low-code, no-code, eh, suelen tener una anualidad. Porque cuando tú compras una licencia, te incluye, te incluye de todo. Dependiendo de con quién vas, tienes el paquete de que, ok, hay una herramienta para crear algo, hasta hay una herramienta para crear algo, Uh, y una plataforma donde lo puedo publicar, donde está el hosting, donde me cuidan la seguridad, donde, uh, o sea, básicamente tengo que hacer clic en un botón de publicar, así como con un sitio web, con un tipo Wix, uh, etcétera, estas fáciles para publicar. Este web está más hacia acá. Uh, algunos otros sí requieren que tú manejas o gestionas tus propios servidores, etcétera, etcétera. Este, pero sí, uh, aquí tenemos empresas aquí en Panamá de 5 o 10 usuarios que quieren tener un sistema sencillo, uh, que están pagando, bueno, digamos una anualidad de alrededor de unos 2 mil dólares anuales, que es competitivo si lo compares con, um, si están haciendo un poco de algo de CRM, que están haciendo algo de, de facturación electrónica. Que normalmente, o sea, tienes que combinar como tres, cuatro suscripciones o tres, cuatro programas uh, que quizás no están en la nube, etcétera, etcétera. Y, y definitivamente es competitivo con la ventaja de que es full customizado y lo puedes crecer. O sea, cuando va creciendo tu, tu negocio, no es que estás buscando otro proveedor, otro proveedor, otro proveedor. Y hasta una empresa de 5 o 10 personas podría tener su departamento de, departamento de TI siendo alguien que se mete en el curso, que se mete a, a, a aprender cómo crear cosas alrededor del core que les creamos para ellos. Entonces, si quieren agregar funcionalidad alrededor de lo que tienen al inicio, porque se expande el negocio, porque nueva línea de productos, porque otra sucursal, Cosas así, no es que siempre tienes que uh, regresar a buscar alternativas, pero puedes ir evolucionando juntos. Obviamente con eso se va a crecer tu licencia, uh, pero lo puedes hacer en el momento que lo necesitas. Es un poco el caso de, uh, de Sara que estaba aquí, de Mindsful. Ellos uh, inicialmente se acercaron porque les interesaba... Eh, Creación de prototipo rápido. Ellos están en un, en, en un sector donde, bueno, están creando una aplicación, están creando un portal y parte están buscando clientes y en parte están buscando inversionistas. Y lo que llaman el, el vaporware antes, que era una idea y un mock-up, uh, llegar con, con cliente, con inversionista y decir, mira, tengo algo, te va a encantar, ya no funciona tan bien en, hoy en día. 
Y si quieres crear una aplicación tipo, bueno, Native Mobile, fácil te va a costar unos 10 miles de dólares para crear un, una versión básica. Este, y ellos dijeron, pues, bueno, tengo que pagar para mi éxito antes de tener el éxito. Y esto es algo que puedes evitar con una solución uh, tipo web, tipo no code, que tú creas esta parte de, de, de la funcionalidad que va a ser la más llamativa. Y con esto tú empiezas a acercarte de los clientes. Uh, hasta les puedes dar acceso gratis por un rato, luego vas con inversionistas y ya no tienes que decir, mira, esta es mi idea y aquí hay unos slides, unos mockups. No, mira, aquí esto es lo que hemos hecho y vamos a agregar tal, 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 tal cosa. Y si es un cliente que luego dice, como, como le menciono a Sara, de que, pero yo lo quiero así, hasta en una reunión así en vivo puedes estar agregando funcionalidad. Y van a ver, ah, cuando dice que, que es personalizado, sí es cierto. Este, cuando dice que es rápido el retooling, sí es cierto. Este, y un poco lo mismo para pymes, ¿no? De que puedes crear algo, puedes hacerlo tú mismo si lo quieres. Uh, hay un muy buen caso en, en el sitio de, de WEM que, ok, es pyme en el sentido que no tienen mucha, mucha gente trabajando, pero sí son grandes en el, en el turnover. Um, te lo voy a buscar, lo pongo aquí en el, en el chat. Pero básicamente alguien que, que sí dijo que, mira, yo necesito esta parte de un ERP y lo voy a construir. Uh, y se tomó el curso el, el gerente de IT. Uh, y creo que como en un mes había creado todo el sistema haciendo el testing y ya estaban entrando los clientes, todo el mundo de adentro de la empresa y así. Um, así que sí, es algo que te, que te habilita para hacer muchas cosas. Pero bueno, todo cuesta dinero. Uh, claro. Eso no, no se puede evitar. Sí, sí, perfecto. Más bien, muchas gracias. A ti, Álvaro. ¿Alguien más que, que tiene alguna pregunta? Si no, Sean, sé que sé que quieres compartir tu Ferrari. <laughs> Yes, and first I will share it with you. Um, let me Please go yeah. ahead. Yeah, let me share my screen. No, I just do my whole screen, and then I need to click it and say share. Yeah, if correct, you see one slide with faces, correct or not? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You, you it, can get the dots and change the layout. From every every one of us can change the layout. So does. Sorry, you want me to change or? No, no. Each of us has to do it. Ah, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, I have a very big screen, so that makes it a little bit difficult. Um, maybe I will. I but let me try something else so it is easier for all of you. Um, Ritz, show me. I'll share again. Fenster. And this should be working now. So basically everyone should just see only the screen, correct? You see the web innovation box and you see two okay. things, yeah? Okay, this is what I am living for. So earlier, David was saying uh, we are working late after working hours. I am not working at all. I have so much fun in doing this and I get so much energy from seeing happy people working together uh, with uh, low code, no code, uh, that I can't say I'm working. So for me, it doesn't matter whether it's five o'clock in the morning or seven o'clock in the evening. This is what I need to do. But the Ferrari, two years ago, uh, I had a little vision. Uh, I like Formula One very much. So sorry for those who do not like Formula One, uh, but it's just to create a, a, a piece of imaging on how I look in developing with no code. Um, and in that time, Ferrari was not doing well. So I'm not sure whether my vision helps Ferrari to improve 
and now being a real competitor with uh, our Max. Uh, but this is the idea. Um, and I call this really a hyper agile way of working uh, with implementing new applications with low code. So first, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but on the middle top there, it says circuit recognition. So the first thing you need to do is what is the organization about? Uh, what are the, what is the culture? What is the structure? What is the architecture needed? Uh, like recognizing the circuit on a, a Formula One track, you need to know when to go where. Um, that helps you to get the project moving. For example, if I don't acknowledge the fact that we have an enterprise architecture that wants to know which application I'm building, it will block me at the end of the day because everyone will say, hey, you didn't ask anyone from enterprise architecture. So, for example, this is the uh, control system. So go and look for it, the environment. Where are you? And keep an eye for more or less the architecture of that organization. Uh, check how the organization is feeling. I mean, if organization is a, in a very bad loss, yeah, you can try to implement systems, but mostly there is no money. Or when the culture is like evasive from innovative tooling, yeah, you can, you have to approach in a different way with no code, low code. Um, on the third basis, you set up the perfect team. And the perfect team is not only the team that works with it, it's not only IT staffing, it's the business, it's uh, the process guys, it is IT, uh, it might be customers, it might be suppliers, uh, everyone needs to be in the team and put them on expertise on the right moment. So not all together for the whole time frame of the project. No, okay, we're dealing now with uh, customer information. At that point, you take the customer in line. Uh, so work, as we call it, uh, without boundaries. So don't put it for yourself. Okay, I'm the one developing this uh, uh, application. No, you build it together in a wide scale. You make a sketch first. So we say in four or five hours, we build a sketch of an ap application that you can use. And then um, you build the proof of concept, minimal viable product. Uh, and then you tell yourself, well, am I still in line with the task that was given? So what was the problem? So in this imaging and saying like with to, to drive up to a mountain with a Formula One car is not going to happen. Uh, so and of course I can drive with a Formula One car, but it's not going to work. It's the same what we said earlier. If you want to build a, a accounting system, you're not going to do it with WAM. Uh, so, when you build your scale model, take a moment and look back. What was the task at hand? What was the problem? Are we solving the problem or are we creating a new problem? So, really step back in that moment saying, okay, we have done all this. We have made a scale model, a minimal file product. So, is this really good for the task at hand? At that moment, you say go or no go. So, you can still stop and you lose maybe two days of work. Um, then when you say, okay, let's go, then you're really gonna uh, um, modelize your application. Uh, so you develop, in this case, the car, but you need to be aware because it goes so fast and people are getting so enthusiastic that it's very easy to go off track. Within two days, not looking uh, with each other what you're doing, um, it, it could be that there is a new feature in the application that you're like, where did it came from? So create a proper way of looking at the track limits. So make that clear in the team. This is what we're going to build. This is what we're going to test. And when you go and test, include all disciplines. So basically the opposite of the people that you put in the team to create it, you need to have in your test. And then you go and then you make sure that you inform everyone what have you built, what are you expecting, and you create a monitoring system. And this is basically what you need to do, creating a no-code application. And it's not different than creating a standard high-code application. It is only a very fast way of doing it. So 
basically what I'm saying is the business can create their application, but don't ask them to create anything about safety measures. Uh, don't ask them anything about making documentation for the application. So that's what I'm trying to do here. And if you look at that, then I have one more slide to show what we did is we created amongst many, but a central uh, login system, single sign-on connected to the Dutch government. We have a, a governmental look and feel. We have version control built in. We worked on procurement, dashboarding, contracting uh, in the finance department and in the business. So we have done a lot of applications that already in this case, uh, uh, last October were running live. So I wanted to share this with you, especially my Ferrari, because that is really the way to look at um, uh, making an application. So don't just make the application. What is the need? What is the problem? And solve the problem at hand. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I will try to Thank you. Thank go. you very much, Sean. I, uh, a parenthesis. Uh, Marco knows this, uh, and Alvaro as well. But uh, I do collaborate with, um, it's called the Research Technology Research Club, Club de Investigación Tecnológica yeah. in Costa Rica. And um, we have more or less one, one talk, one hour, one hour and a half talk every month. And if you feel all right, I would love to invite you to uh, talk about your experiences doing this kind of, I mean, not, not the specifics, but this kind of rapid value driven uh, application development for, uh, for a government, yeah. which might, might, might provide a wonderful and inspiring exemplar to us all in Costa Rica. Yeah. If, uh, I, mean, I will contact you, I will contact you and uh, see if you can fit into your, into your agenda if you're willing, but it would be wonderful and an honor if you if you could come and share your views with, with a public which is mostly CIOs, yeah. from mid-sized to, to large-sized Costa Rican scale companies. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would just say uh, let's do it because I'd love to share, uh, especially around the world. I worked for or five years in tuberculosis and I run around the world already. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it's good to do it at least with David uh, because if there is any explanation needed in, in Spanish, uh, then he's a better and faster translator than me. You can uh, do it in English, but yeah. if you feel okay oh, with Spanish, yeah. we can do it in Spanish. Yeah. But I mean, like, it's it's good to, to make that combination as such. I'm happy to uh, jump in. I'm yeah. happy to jump in and provide references outside of government frameworks and so on. Uh, yeah. If, 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 if you need me, I'm there. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Wonderful. And uh, Marco already knows that I've, I've already invited him. We need to fix a, we, we need to fix a date. So I would like to, to showcase these ideas into CIOs in Costa Rica who will not attend this kind of seminar, which is more like a university seminar today, yeah. but that, that's a forum, an enterprise forum, and I would like to, to invite you. Yeah. And, and I think you have, to, you have something to offer for them as well from the university perspective, because yeah. you are the capacity container for them <laughs> to increase their business opportunities. Yes. Uh, and, and that's why I earlier mentioned uh, uh, stringently a company doesn't need to do the capacity all internally. You need to have traineeships. You need to have university yeah. staffing because you create a collaboration on the knowledge, on the reason knowledge from a university, but you also input reality knowledge from businesses at this moment, what they are running through. So it is really a, a, a beneficial uh, a, yeah. a benefit for all. So yeah. Yeah, we had a. We've actually had demand here from from government and from from private sector, but mostly from government. And hey, can you can you please teach uh, the people who want to do their practica profesional uh, some <laughs> women before they come and join us, so that you know they can do more than make coffee and do a little bit of Python, you know, working on boring stuff somewhere in the corner of a big application. They're doing something. Uh, because 
the people that we had, we had uh, a few people from from that we had put it through our trainings, very much similar profile as, as, as a lot of the young people here present today, come and do their practica with us. And, and they are now working with us, uh, the majority of them already. Uh, and they were also the envy of uh, all their classmates because all their classmates, they were working on... Uh, yeah, small, boring little bits of pieces that the high-level <laughs> programmers didn't want to do, so they got outsourced. Some of them weren't even working on programming or creating software at all. And <laughs> our guys built an entire platform uh, from scratch for, for one of our clients uh, within, within the few months, and most of what they were doing was learning. Uh, so, yeah. And I think there's a separate discussion to be had with uh, yes, yes, yes. Alvaro about uh, yes. let's see if we can do something with Symphotech. That can happen also here with Yandor and when Exactly. Uh, we, we offer all that. Oh, Marco uh, is looking for people. Okay. So, excellent. Thank so you, guys. I, I thank you all, um, Sean, David, Marco, for propitiating all this, Alvaro, for sponsoring and offering the space at the university. Thank you to the, the ladies who have remained with us till the end. And we have over 20 people attending. I'm very happy about it. So we'll discuss in the future for, for, for a date at a different forum. And thank you very much for sharing your experiences, knowledge, and all, all the happy things oh, that, yes. that are contagious. Yes. Uh, yeah, we'll and talk about I the past of some other day. That's, <laughs> we should go above, above, well beyond just satisfaction, but having yeah. fun. Okay, thank you. Doing good that's things great. that improve the quality of life of people, that's a wonderful thing. And by the end of the day, every employee in your company is so happy that they, don't, they feel the same like me. We are not working. And that empowers <laughs> so much in your business. Confucius, so, uh, Confucius said that. Said yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, so that is that's how it goes. I am looking forward to the meeting, and I am very happy that you invited me. So thank you so much, you. and uh, we see each other in the future. Uh, David has my contact information, so if anyone Wonderful. needs to want to have some more clarification or ask questions, please do so. Send me an email or contact me. Uh, email is most preferable in the time uh, uh, relay, but uh, please feel free to do so. Yeah, thank Excellent. you. So much. Thank you very much, gentlemen, ladies. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.